Hello, I'm Pascal Guitera. I'm Associate Professor at Sina Uni and I'm Head of the Dermatology Department at Melanoma Institute Australia and the Sydney Melanoma Diagnostic Centre at um, RPA. I would like to talk to you about sun protection. I think it's very important because nearly 100% of our uh, clean carcinoma and nearly 90% of the melanoma seems to be due to the sun. So we should have this conversation maybe yearly with our patient and see what they're doing and see if we can demystify some of the problem with sun cream and protection. One of the examples is that I have is some of my patient tell me, well, I'm really good, I put my sun cream every morning. But I told them, you know, if you put your sun cream at 7 a.m., at 11 a.m., it's totally gone, it has decay, and that's where the sun is bad and where you need the most protection. So one of the questions we have is what is the best sun cream? And people try to work out what is the chemical and the physical sun cream. In fact, all of them are chemically derived, but there is one type of filter that are more UV organic filter that are absorbing the UV radiation. This type are typically the avobenzone and the benzophenone. There is another type of filter that are typically the mineral one that are not organic and they deflect the light, so basically reflecting the whole thing. So they're typically the titanium and dioxide and the zinc oxide. These ones are said to be less irritant than the um, chemical one, but all of them are quite safe and, and well tested and most of the sun cream will contain a mixture of all. The best sun cream is the one that is 50 plus and broad spectrum. In Australia, there is no silly product. They've all been tested as medication, but there is silly SPF. So for example, an SPF 8 will be a complete waste of money and time. So what is SPF? The sun protection factor is in fact a, a test to see the protection against the UVB. The UVB has a shorter wavelength compared to UVA and they tested um, using some volunteer and having their back exposed to the light with the sun cream and without. An SPF 15 will give them 15 more time to become red before they, they, they have the sunburn. So it's more length of time that we're measuring them. So one of the problem when they're testing this um, sun cream is they use a thick layer. Um, it's two milligram per centimeter square and it's no way what a normal person will do. And so when we begin with an SPF 50, often we put maybe 25% of the, this coverage. And so we already have 20, an SPF 20 or something like that. And so after two hours of going um, to the beach, it's gone, it's, um, it's a problem. You need to reapply it. So that's important and begin with an SPF very high and then you will be correctly covered. One of the things that is important also is UVA. So the UVA are important for the photocarcinogenesis and also the photoaging. One of the, te the tests sorry, for the UVA filter are not well established, there is controversy yet there. But the regulation in Australia have decided that to be broad spectra, you have to cover the UVA at least of one third of the UVB coverage. So when you choose an high SPF, then your protection against the UVA are correct. And that's another advantage of beginning very high, is to have a correct protection in UVA. Now, one of the um, questions I have is, should I buy an expensive sun cream? What is the difference in between the expensive one and the non-expensive one? And my answer is basically the expensive sun cream often have more filter and filter that decay a little bit less rapidly. But the problem is that if you buy a very small tube and put only on the top of your nose, you're not well protected. And if you're going from the beach with a big family, you're much better to have a big container. As far as you reapply, you will be completely safe. So we advise two hours to reapply. Now, some people said they're allergic. Um, the real allergy to the sun cream are really rare. Most of the time it's just irritating. One of the answers to that is to try different sun cream, little samples sometimes, and also go to the sensitive skin product. Often they contain this famous mineral filter that are less irritative, and it's with really a photosensitivity to the sun. They may need a, a referral letter to dermatology because it's a complex uh, area. 
and my baby. So it's true the baby have really a very permeable barrier of the skin. So in particular, the newborn should not have any sun cream. What we advise is just to put them in the shade until they're six months or so, it's quite easy to control. For the eight months to two years, we often advise this mineral filter with no nanoparticle. They have a lot of problem with this nanoparticle. But in fact, they're not dangerous, as far as the barrier of the skin is well respected. So these nano are very useful to have all this mineral filter that appear white to not appear white or, or, or tinted. And so they are in a lot of sun cream. It's only if you have a wound open or bad dermatitis, something like that, it makes sense to not apply um, this sort of sun cream. So one of the problem we have also is a thin people. They don't like to protect. And often they say, well, it's plug my pore and, and then I develop terrible acne. So you can always go for the sun cream that are um, for uh, non-oil um, or for acne design sort of sun cream that are uh, perfectly appropriate. It's also a myth that the sun diminishes the inflammation. So when they go on holiday, they, they look like it's a lot better. But when they come back to school, it flares up completely because in fact the sun is bad, it thickens the skin. And, and so it gives this um, sort of getting better and then flare up. And if they protect all, all, uh, all along, they will not have this um, flare up correctly. I try to convince the team to protect. It is important because at the age where they may have the very bad sunburn and the melanoma is caused by that. That's a problem because of the peer influence and often I talk to them about cosmetic more than about cancer because they're not really receptive to the cancer talk. They're invincible at this age, but they do bother about freckle and, and, and wrinkle. Then another question is, uh, should I apply in winter? So the, the answer is to look at the UV index. In winter time, the UV index sometimes is quite high and it's not at all a question of temperature. So people need to realize it's not a hot day they need to protect, it's the UV index. They're easy to find on apps like SunSmart and this sort of things to, to um, check if it's a bad day or a good day. So then the problem is vitamin D. So vitamin D is important and a deficiency will create osteoporosis, but sun cream is not creating osteoporosis. If you use sun cream normally with a normal layer, it should not decrease your vitamin D level. It's true that some patients have deficiency and it seems to be more a problem of genetic background than really their habit. The next question is, should I test all my patients? And the answer is no, it's too expensive and it's also not very reliable. So there is a lot of seasonal variation. I do go with my good son and I do test my patients who are really phobic to the sun. And I think if I found the vitamin D deficiency, an important thing is to give supplementation, not to send them in the sun. So in conclusion, I think um, we do need to have a tailored message. It's important to ask all these questions to our patients and, and try to um, ask them to protect. It's great to be outdoor. It's great for the body, for the mind to be active, uh, but it should be with good protection in Australia. And if you really think your patients are not doing the right thing or have not doing uh, the right thing before, you should undress them and have a good look because that's how we save life. Thank you.